So thanks, Guy, and thanks for, uh, for, for asking us, and thanks for stimulating the group discussions, because I do think it's really exciting that we're all going down there this year, and it's great that we, uh, we're talking about these things uh, in advance. I have to confess that uh, our thinking hasn't advanced hugely on last year's, uh, but um, it, in, it's a little bit unfortunate because the group who are planning the missions are down in Southampton uh, this afternoon uh, and planning their, uh, putting together a little bit more f uh, meat on the bones, I suppose. Uh, so um, we'll, yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm Karen Hayward. Um, Tarzan is the project that we're doing our uh, work under, uh, which is joint between us and various collaborators in the US, uh, led by Erin Pettit at Oregon State. And, uh, and we have a, um, a team of glaciologists, atmospheric scientists, and uh, oceanographers involved, including Anna, who will follow on. So for those who weren't here last year or haven't been in other meetings, uh, the goals of Tarzan are very much linking the atmosphere, ocean and the ice. I suppose that's our um, what we hope to bring to the project. And uh, we're interested in the circulation under the ice, particularly Thwaites. And, uh, and we're, um, yeah, we not only have observations, but we also have modelling and, uh, and looking at reanalyses. So there are other bits of the project that are uh, complementary. So one of the things that I think is worth telling you a little bit about is uh, as part of the observational plan we have these uh, stations on the ice and these were installed um, 18 months ago. They're called Amigos and uh, they uh, measure a various, uh, some various atmospheric properties. So uh, the weather systems. Uh, there are lots of measurements through the ice. Uh, one of the particularly interesting ones that I'm not going to talk to you about, but uh, is this uh, distributed temperature sensor, the fiber optic cable going through the ice and into the ocean. And that's proving very interesting. So there are measurements through the ice and then into the ice shelf cavity there are uh, temperature, salinity and velocity measurements. So one of our goals uh, for the, the upcoming mission is going to be getting somewhere close to the Amigos and, uh, and surveying that region to give some spatial context for the temporal time series. Uh, okay, so that's what's shown in this figure. So here, here are, this is a schematic of the Amigo station. The plan is to have ocean gliders going along the ice front, so not going under the ice, but in the open water in front of the ice front, and uh, AUVs going inside the cavity and surveying uh, the region between the ice shelf front and the Amigos. There'll also be seal tagging going on, uh, which will give us uh, a, nearly a year's worth of temperature and salinity profiles in the region uh, to set our amigos into context. And there'll be lots of measurements on the ship uh, going on during the, the upcoming cruise. And uh, this figure summarizes all the different observations that we're going to be making on the cruise. So it's on the Nathaniel B. Palmer. Uh, it sails on the 2nd of January uh, from Punta Arenas and gets back to Punta Arenas on the 8th of March, give or take a few days. Uh, and there will be two other projects on board, Artemis, which is adding biogeochemistry to Tarzan, and Thor, which is doing um, coring and, and geophysics. So Rob Hall is going to be the, the lead scientist of that. Uh, we're going to be doing seal tagging, CTDs, microstructure profiling uh, everywhere we can. We're going to be deploying six ocean gliders, sea gliders, and deploying the Autosub Long Range in this picture and Anna's uh, Hugin, which you'll hear about afterwards. So uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, the results from these two Amigo stations, these, uh, these time series. So this figure will hopefully get your eye in. So this is uh, the eastern ice tongue of Thwaites. 
and uh, the two uh, amigos are here. One is called cavity and one is called channel. And as you can see from this uh, ice thickness map, there's a, a channel coming in here from, uh, from the east or northeast, uh, bringing water into here. So we're going to be, we're particularly interested in, in that region. I'll come back to that later on. Cavity is not that far away, uh, but in, uh, not in the channel. Uh, this one is just for information. This is the time series that was uh, that is maintained by the other uh, International Thwaites Classic Collaboration project called MELT, and that's at the grounding line. So the right hand figure shows, uh, well, a number of things. So the black is the seabed as best we know it. And the uh, gray is the ice shelf base from bed machine version two. Uh, and which is, as far as I'm aware, the best gridded data set to date. The, the horizontal uh, lines here are where the actual ice base was uh, at the time of drilling the uh, hot water drilling holes through here. So as you can see in the channel, so the channel is, is detected uh, in bed machine, but the depths are not terribly good. That's what, a bit less than 100 meters out. Uh, whereas at the cavity location, uh, the depth from bed machine was out by 150 meters. So I point this out as a sort of cautionary tale for our planning of AUV missions that the uh, bathymetry is not very well known and neither is the base of the ice shelf. So this over here on the right is, is the melt location at the grounding line. We've also put on here the uh, the, the velocities, the time mean velocities and time mean temperatures. So for those planning missions, this may be uh, quite useful. So the time mean velocities are a few centimeters a second, so quite small. And uh, this again is the same figure, bottom left, and we've put on here the time mean velocities. And uh, there are two, I, I should have said that in the previous one probably. There were two sensors in the cavity at each one. So one kind of mid depth and one near the bottom, this one um, near the surface or near the, near the ice, uh, this one at the bottom. So we have time series from each of those. Uh, and uh, there is an inflow at both locations parallel to this channel. I have had interesting discussions with the glaciologists as to which comes first, the flow of warm water in or the, um, or the, the crack, the, uh, the channel that in the ice shelf. So we've got uh, continuous measurements from January 2020. This one goes up till April this year. There are data after that, uh, but that was when I think it ran out of um, solar power to transmit it back. So in this season's uh, campaign, we'll be recovering all of the data for the last uh, two years. Okay, and uh, this figure shows the um, a, a sort of uh, wind rows, current rows of the, uh, of the flows in those, uh, at those locations. So you can see the predominant direction uh, coming in uh, at all four uh, of the channel bottom it's a little bit smaller, but it, and it's a bit more variable all over the place. So uh, one of the things we've been interested in is the, uh, is the flow into uh, the, the cavity beneath weights, as well as the uh, outflow of meltwater. And this shows meltwater from uh, Yoshi Nakayama's uh, model. And uh, I, I show it really because it's kind of stimulating our thinking. Um, of what's going beneath weights and the upstream effects of Pine Island. Uh, it's only a model. Uh, it's the sort of thing that we'd like to, to verify and compare with the measurements that we'll make this year. It's a really cool model. I love these eddies going. Um, so the sea ice is obviously going to be a major uh, challenge for all of us. And uh, I put these 
figures here just to illustrate how different the 1920 year was to the 2021 year. So in 1920, uh, there was uh, quite a lot of open water. This is Thwaites. We could have got in th into th uh, Thwaites uh, from the east reasonably easily. We could have got down to Pine Island. And in fact, the Koreans did some lovely work down there. So uh, that would be great. This was sort of December to March 2021, so earlier on this year. And that whole region was uh, covered in sea ice for much of the time. So let's hope it was it will be more like the previous year. So I now have some slides from uh, Alex Phillips uh, at NOC, who is the uh, team lead for Ultra Sub Lung Range, and he's on the call so he can uh, tell me if I've got anything wrong. Um, so the Ultra Sub Long Range uh, that we're going to be taking with us, uh, perhaps for this um, meeting, the most useful things to know are what sensors is going to have. It's going to have upward looking and downward looking 300 kilohertz ADCP, which are used both for navigation and for re re uh, using the uh, giving us the velocity field. We're going to have the uh, micro rider turbulence for mixing beneath the ice shelf. We're going to have CTDs and dissolved oxygen and the wet, wet labs puck for um, uh, optical backscatter, which is good for the signature of the meltwater. Um, okay, so uh, they've been, the team at Southampton have been working really hard on preparing the auto sub -lung range ready for the mission. They've had trials this year, they've got another one coming up. Uh, in, even including virtual experiments, which I'm intrigued by. That's shown in this right-hand figure. And so the, the command and control have been upgraded and improved uh, together with obstacle avoidance, which obviously will be important for going beneath the ice shelf. And here she is, uh, setting off at the end of September. And the next time we see her, hopefully she will be in Punta Arenas as uh, uh, when, when, uh, when the team arrive in December. So a little bit on missions. Um, I should say that all of the rest of the mission, or all of the rest of the figures of missions will be in glaciology view. So that has north to the left and uh, east to the top of the page. I find this very confusing, but that's what glaciologists give us. So the previous figures, we had Thwaites up, up at the top. We've now rotated it round. So here is the uh, approximate location of the uh, through ice moorings, the Amigos. Grounding lines over here, open water over here, Pine Island Glacier up here. And we have here some possible missions. So um, one might go in through this region uh, in, uh, or one might want to go in or out through, uh, through this side, which is where that, uh, the, the channel is. So these are indicative missions, uh, 200 kilometers, uh, taking approximately four days. And uh, so I've now got a few figures from uh, Christian Wild uh, at Oregon State uh, to give you a little bit of um, background to the ice shelves. So uh, this is uh, surface elevation. So I just want to point out some locations. So this is the channel mouth. So this is the channel. This is the feature that we're, we're interested in, this inflow and the amigos here in that channel. This is the, the yellow dot is the other uh, amigos. And, uh, and then other options for going in would be over here. So the right hand figure is the uh, ice thickness uh, in the same region. So pinning points are here. Red is the grounding line or 2010 grounding line. Uh, the dashed line is 2017 grounding line. Uh, so these two figures uh, are, so this figure is the uh, bottom bathymetry, the seabed bathymetry and perhaps uh, of most relevance to us today is this figure on the right, which is the cavity thickness. So 
uh, green is 400 meters, going into blues at 200 meters. We don't want to go anywhere near the red areas uh, because that's where the, the ice shelf, shelf is pinned, it's grounded. Uh, so we will probably take uh, the uh, auto sub uh, and maybe Hugin in this side and probably also uh, this side. Our plan B, uh, this isn't Swates, but uh, we think it's sensible to have a plan B and our plan B is to go to Dotson, which is just uh, further west. And these are the same images for, for Dotson. Um, the, there has been some nice glider and, and uh, uh, float work uh, beneath Dotson. Uh, but that would be uh, an option if we can't get to Thwaites or we would go to Pine Island. So these are the same figures. And in fact, we uh, we have uh, instrumentation as part of Tarzan on, uh, on Dotson. So if we could get there uh, to Dotson and send the, uh, the subs uh, towards this region with the square, then that would be great. So that's our, that's our plan B option. Okay, I think that's all I have for you. So I hope that was useful for future discussions. Thank you very much, Karen. I think that was yeah, that's a lovely, great update. And I think I've seen a lot of uh, extensions since last year. <laughs> um, I've got a few questions, but I'd, I'd like to open up to see if anyone else has any questions off the bat. It's all very quiet. Or maybe I'll start off. So the the channel uh, that seems new is that relatively new, or have you always known about that channel? It's such a pronounced feature, and and also what causes it? Is that the warm? You said you mentioned the warm water, but it's at the surface so, of the ice. Um. Yes, I don't know if it's a new feature. I, it's new to me. Um. I don't know if it was discovered when the Tarzan team did their, their geophysics um, sort of seismic type, anyway, their surveys when they went there. Um, I think you can see it at the surface, so they probably did know about it. Um, I, I don't think it's caused by the oceanography. Um, the glaciologists seem to think it's, it's more of a, a rift, a crack in the, uh, in the ice, a glaciological process. Um, but I, I suppose what interested us was the fact that it does seem to channel the, the inflow. The, the inflow is so parallel to that, um, that channel. That can't be a coincidence. It must be being driven by the, the bathymetry or the, uh, the thickness of the cavity, I guess. Hmm. And well, if there's no other questions, I'll keep going. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> um, you mentioned the very strong differences in the sea ice between the two years. Is there is there some point in October, November where you get a bit of a predictor of what it's going to be like? And, and, and is there any sort of forecasting by any of the groups in that sense? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we haven't been doing that, but it's a good suggestion. Yeah, don't know. Hmm. I'll keep going. The um, <laughs> the the micro rider probe. How are you positioning that on the AUV? Was that actually in the picture you showed, or is that going to be a separate sort of installation? Oh, um, Alex, do you want to answer that? I think it's the same as in the picture. Yeah, it's the same as in the picture, so it's straight out of the front of the AUV. Yeah, great. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, and I should say, we're very open yeah. uh, to um, suggestions and, and comments, and uh, uh, Alex and Rob and Tiago are going to be discussing this this afternoon, so you know, we'll, we'll take any uh, feedback from this meeting uh, into that discussion this afternoon. I thought the other interesting thing was the simulation work looked really great and um, it'd be interesting to see more detail on that at some point and, and yeah I guess lessons learned for how how effective and how useful that's been. 
Did you have a comment on that at this stage, Alex? Yeah, so we're predominant. So for us, the the simulation is really being used for testing our new obstacle avoidance and sort of um, under ice manoeuvres. Um, so we are using it to exercise the AUV control system. So it, it's purely an engineering tool at this stage. Yeah, great. Well, going well for time. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, if any other questions pop up, we'll have a bit of an open session at the end, so it's not too late.